All right, we're with Arthi Prabhakar at the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2013. And thank you so much for talking with us. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here. And I think this is a great example of how challenges foster innovation. I want to get your perspective on that, too. Absolutely. And of course, DARPA is in the business of breakthrough technologies. Uh, ha that's what we've been doing for five and a half decades. Uh, challenges are a relatively new tool in our, in our bag of tricks. Um, and starting over the last decade or so, we found that they're, they're a tremendously effective way to do a particular part of the innovation puzzle, which is to bring different teams together to tackle a, a shared set of tasks and just see what people can actually do. What we find is, you know, and you'll see when you're walking around here at the DRC, the teams have been working on each of these individual technologies for a very long time. There's huge, deep technical expertise, but a challenge like this forces them to put all the pieces together and actually build a system that's, that has some capability. And it, it's a really good way to ring out where the technology really is to spark competitive juices and show the world what's possible. And there's a range of all different types of teams, everything from major defense contractors, Lockheed Martin is here, all the way down to you know, small universities and absolutely you know, yeah. different parts of the country, small innovators. Is that part of the reason a challenge is a good idea? It is, and you know, just in a little bit broader context, the way DARPA has succeeded in our work over many decades is it, part of the strength of our model is that we're able to tap a huge range of different technical communities, just recognizing that the solutions to our future challenges aren't all going to be located in any one kind of organization. So we have a long history of working with universities, companies large and small, companies that know they're in the defense business and companies who don't particularly think they're in the defense business, uh, labs, not-for-profits, government labs of all different sorts. And, and similarly, you see, first of all, you see all those players here. You might also notice that a number of the teams have uh, people from lots of different organizations who've come together and brought their complementary skills, which, which is really exciting to see as well. And not all of them are funded, right? That's so right. some of them are competing just for bragging rights or the possibility of future funding. That's right. So that's a great bang for the buck for It Darpa is. Too. It is a good bang for the buck. I think it also it, it allows us to do two things. One is to put the resources to work because there is a lot of very hard research engineering work that goes into getting these capabilities up and running and, and having the ability to make that investment I think is key. But at the same time we know that there are organizations in the United States and some outside that would be wonderful to find out what they can do against these same set of challenges and I, I just thought it was terrific that Gil Pratt, the program manager, had designed the DRC to be open to all comers. And that's another thing I'm interested in, how an idea like this becomes a DARPA program? Does it start with the program manager? Does it start with an outside idea? So talk a bit about that specifically in this case, but also in general. How, right. does, how does right. an idea get to and, be a program? And the answer for a challenge is very much the same as the answer for any DARPA program. Almost always a DARPA program begins with a DARPA program manager. They are the heart and soul of our organization. We only have about 100 program managers at any moment in time, and they rotate through the agency. Typically, they're only there about three or five years. They come from across the broad technical community. They bring technical depth and insight but also a bigger perspective about what's really going to make a difference for our national security challenges, for breakthrough technologies. And uh, in, in this case, as when, with it, any other, in this case it was Gil Pratt, the program manager, who had an inspiration and uh, an idea about something that would take the field of robotics forward. It's an area that he had worked in, he knew deeply, um, but he saw an opportunity, uh, particularly in this case he was inspired by the challenges that we saw after the tsunami in Japan and uh, the Fukushima nuclear reactors, everyone in the robotics community looked at that and said, if we had those, the kinds of capabilities we've been dreaming of, think what a difference it would have made to have robots be able to intervene in this complex human-designed environment that is now poisoned, it's impossible for humans to function in it. Wouldn't it be great if we really had robotics that could tackle those challenges? So that was the genesis, and then from that, Gil crafted, you know, as you, as you can see when you walk around here, you can see how hard it is to craft a really compelling challenge, something that is just hard enough that it's really pushing 
everybody. Not quite impossible, but you know, certainly not easy. If you watch the robots, you'll see that it, none of this is very easy for them, especially at this stage. Um, but crafting all of that, figuring out how to make it open to the widest possible community, figuring out how to structure it so that people who just wanted to do software could, could compete as well as those who wanted to build the hardware and software. All of that complexity really was driven by Gil. And so that was his baby. He didn't have to go through committees. He didn't have to have you know, sign off. Well, he had to have a little bit of help. So, so, tell me, so a typical tell me about process that. at yeah. DARPA mm -hmm. begins with the program manager. That program manager has two layers of management at DARPA that we're organized into technical offices. And then there's my office, myself and my deputy, Steve Walker. And for a new program to be approved at DARPA requires first that the office sign off and allocate resources to the program with, with a start date and an end date and a budget that ties to what the program is trying to do. And then Steve and I get final sign off at the director level for the agency on each program. So across the agency we've got about 200 programs at any moment in time. There's always something new starting a program like this that's fully underway, others that are ending and wrapping up. And um, it, it's, a, it's a process with, we think, the right amount of oversight to make sure we're getting, we're investing in really powerful new capabilities and that we're balancing our portfolio. But it's also designed to be a process where a driven program manager with a vision can, can move very rapidly from talking to the technical community, figuring out what the challenge should be, what the program should be, putting the program together, getting resources, and then going out and executing. And how long does that process take from that, it, can, it can take a short time or a long time yeah. depending on, you know, a program manager might come in sometimes with an idea of what they want to do. Uh, even then, we really want them to get out and talk to the broad community, uh, not sitting, you know, it doesn't really work if you just sit in your office and make up answers. It's really all about engagement with the places where breakthrough ideas are bubbling but also with people in the user community. For example, in this case, Gil spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, first responders' needs. And, and you know, craft, from that, that's what it took for him to be able to craft a challenge that would be meaningful in the end. So that brewing process, is that's, that's where ideas for programs are germinated, and it's a very important process. From that, it can be you know, weeks to a few months sometimes to actually put together a powerful program and get the approvals and then launch and start uh, making the investments that build those communities. And DARPA has no um, proving grounds or laboratories of its own, so it's all in the community. Right. That's Everything. exactly from, right. From idea, through development, through execution. Absolutely. Absolutely. The P in DARPA is projects, and so we are designed to do projects that are finite in duration, designed to have big impact. The reason we can do that, uh, and the reason we can be very agile uh, in jumping into new opportunities, is because we're able to tap this much broader community. Uh, and we rely on that big ecosystem that we have. Um, in, in fact, uh, one thing I am want to make sure that we as a society make sure we continue to support is the bigger science and technology ecosystem because we need, we, for us to do what we need to do at DARPA for breakthrough technologies, we have to have universities where the vibrant new ideas are brewing and students are getting educated and we have to have companies that are making their own investments for the future and we have to have the rest of the federal government and the defense department's investments in science and technology. It's, it, we can't do the, the hugely impactful things we do without that whole ecosystem working. And, and what's more important, or can you quantify this, passion or technical ability? Oh, big things happen only when you combine both of those. Yeah, so everyone has some kind of drive from the program manager, yourself, to people putting the stuff together. That's right. That key element has to be passion as well as technical ability. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, that, it, that is the magic combination because you know one without the other doesn't really get you that far but when you get it all all working in the right direction it can be very powerful and, and so sort of going off from that what do you look for in a program manager or a performer yeah. um, what are some of the key qualities that you would look for right away well what I look for in program managers uh, I'll, I'll start with that um, obviously our program managers uh, have to come in the door with technical depth and, uh, a, a, and the basis for technical judgment. And by the way, that's not just about technology, it's also about technologists because, again, we don't have labs, so our program managers aren't going to go 
build it themselves. They're going to be betting on the people in, in all these different kinds of organizations. Uh, and the only thing we know when we embark on a project is that something different is going to happen than what, the, what we think at the beginning. That's the nature of research. It's the nature of taking risk in order to reach for big impact. So I'm looking for a program manager who's going to have that kind of technical judgment about both people that do technology and the technology itself. That's number one. Number two is I need dynamic range. I need someone who can understand bits and atoms, but can also understand what difference it makes and be able to navigate that seamlessly. That's a very precious commodity, a hard to find capability, but something that, that I really treasure. Uh, I'm always looking for people who are driven and passionate, uh, who come into work every morning to get something big done. Um, that's, you know, that sounds obvious, but there are lots of people go, that, lots of reasons that people go to work in the morning. Uh, I need the ones that are driving for, for off-scale impact. Uh, and then finally, I'm looking for people who are confident without being arrogant, um, because you have to be confident to get things done. But at the end of the day, we need to understand that really our job is the public service. We are, we have the great privilege of serving our country by making these investments in new technologies and appreciating and understanding that that's our role is also pretty important. And you, and you mentioned risk in there. And also you mentioned a little bit before portfolio, the idea yeah. of portfolio. And one thing we haven't talked about, I just want to touch on really briefly, is the fact that a lot of DARPA programs, including this one that's going on now, often operate on comparatively small budgets, you know, compared to other government agencies that might be doing big programs. So how do you how do you navigate all those factors? You, you know, um, of doing more with less, um, managing risk, and this portfolio of approach. Do they all complement yeah. each other? Or are they at odds Absolutely with each other? Absolutely, they do. Now I think that it's all part of the whole system. So let's start with the risk piece, which is actually risk is not the point. Risk is what we're willing to take for the objective, which is off-scale impact, right? And I, I we frequently talk at DARPA about. Um, ideas that different people have and I always tell my folks if you know something that's going to change the world and it involves very little risk let's go do that because wouldn't that be awesome right and, and occasionally you find an opportunity like that much more often if you really want to make a big step forward in capability you actually have to expose yourself to, to all kinds of risk especially technical risk in the work that we do so we're willing to take that uh, on and, you know that's that that's what we're designed to do we're willing to fail if, um, if that's what happens, but between taking that risk and the end of the program, we do everything we possibly can to, to drive those risks down, to manage them so that we can succeed. That's really what we're structured to do. And the reason we think, of, the reason I think about our projects as a portfolio is that's how you manage risk. That's how DARPA has managed over five and a half decades in every generation of DARPA we have invested in things that have had off-scale impact, be it the internet or the rest of the information revolution or the contributions to microsystems and MEMS, be it the work we've done on stealth or night vision on the military side. Those things didn't all just happen at one magic period in DARPA's history. It's happened continuously over five and a half decades. And I think the reason is that we've always had a portfolio in which some things failed, but a few things just you know, knock the cover off the ball, and that's what we're always looking to do. And and lower cost, is that part of that? Well, I think that's cost? about being effective with okay. any resources that we do invest. Um, and and I, I think that there are aspects of our model that help us uh, get a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, the focus on high impact, the ability to work uh, with performers of all different types, the active program management that we do that allows us when, you know, we've got programs right now that are doing so well that we know we have to put more resources on them. We have other programs that are not doing as well, and so we pull resources off of them. That, and that kind of continuous management allows us, I think, to optimize and get more impact for every dollar. What's the next big thing? Uh, you know, I look at my 200 programs at DARPA, and I'll tell you that each one of them is, every one of those program managers certainly believes that they're investing in the next big thing. Uh, what we're seeing here at the DARPA Robotics Challenge, I think, shows us both how great the promise of robotics is, but also how, how early we are in the development of these kinds of sophisticated ground robots that can interact in 
human designed environment. So I, I'm very optimistic about what might be possible here, recognizing that it's a long road ahead. Um, if you look across our portfolio at DARPA, we are working to change what uh, happens next with cyber uh, to create a new foundation for cybersecurity in this information context that we're living in uh, daily in our lives publicly, you know, in our private lives as well as in our national security community. We are working to harness um, the information explosion that's happening around us and developing new analytics that let us start getting meaning out of the massive number uh, and types of uh, data that we're surrounded by. Uh, in addition to extending some of the technology areas that we've worked in for many decades, today at DARPA we're making investments um, that focus on biology and its opportunity to create new technologies. Uh, for example, work on infectious disease. Can we build uh, diagnostics that are so cheap and so rapid? Uh, can we build um, the therapies for infectious disease? That, that we can uh, develop and then distribute very quickly. By doing all of that, can we outpace the spread of infectious disease? That's one of, one of many examples of new areas where biology, I think, is starting to be uh, a new and very powerful technology. So I, I, I think those are, you know, those are just some examples. There are many others in uh, our portfolio. Some of them are going to be part of what really changes the next generation. Mm. Mm, thank you. And, and the one last question I want to ask sure. you personally is what's your passion? What's my passion? Well, DARPA's my passion. <laughs> uh, you know, I was very lucky to work at DARPA very early in my career, um, 1986 to 93. And uh, I, I got to do a whole bunch of other very, uh, very satisfying things in the 19 years after I left DARPA. But when I got the chance to come back in 2012, I was just completely thrilled to get to leave this organization because uh, in my experience, this is the place where we have the best opportunity to make the investments that really change the future. Um, and I, the, the leverage that we have from the work that we do at DARPA is something I really treasure. So my passion is to keep that engine humming and to make the investments for the next generation.